Before we get started, I'm going to ask you to do a few things. Don't be a passive learner. Have paper and pencil handy. Pause the video frequently. Rewind and rewatch. Draw as many pictures as you can, because pictures are your friends. Ask questions. Write them down. And go research the answers. And to really test your understanding, try to teach it to someone else in your own words. If you want, leave questions in the comments below, and I'll answer them as soon as I can. Now in this video, our second in our series on DNA, we're going to look at the structure of DNA. We know that DNA contains information needed to carry out cell activities. It's the genetic material, but what's its structure? DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Well, we remember from our earlier videos that all nucleic acids are made of repeating units of nucleotides, and that every nucleotide is composed of a phosphate group, a sugar, and some nitrogen base. And if it's a DNA nucleotide, then that sugar is specifically deoxyribose sugar. Now let's take a closer look at these nitrogenous bases. There are four different types of DNA nucleotides, each differing in their nitrogen base only. There's our double ringed adenine, it's a purine. We have thymine, which is a single ring. You can see the rings out here. We call the single ringed uh, nucleotides pyrimidines. We have guanine, our double ring, another double ring purine, and finally cytosine, another single ring pyrimidine. Now, one of the things that's tough for students is to remember which one of these is which. In other words, how do I remember that the purines are the double rings and that the pyrimidines are the single rings? Well, my hint is that purine has a U in it and so does the word double. Therefore, uh, purines are double and then pyrimidines then uh, by default must be single. And then in terms of remembering which one are pyrimidines and which ones are purines, uh, the pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine both have a Y in them and therefore guanine and adenine must then be purines because that's what's left over. So that's the little trick that I use. You can do it however you want but uh, it's good to know which ones are which. Now these nucleotides are just the building blocks for a large DNA molecule. So we need to put these nucleotides together. And DNA, uh, the nucleotides, is formed by two strands joined together kind of like a ladder. So let's build our own DNA ladder. So I made these a little smaller. I have a bunch of nucleotides. I made them smaller so I can fit more in. And uh, I'm just going to grab a nucleotide. And I'm going to start to make a strand of nucleotides. And I can attach one nucleotide to the next uh, simply by making a bond between the phosphate of one and the sugar of another. The sugar to phosphate bond is how we attach one nucleotide to the other. So then I can grab uh, another and another, and I'll build those bonds. The sugar of one to the phosphate of the next, and the sugar of one to the phosphate of the next. And I can continue. And notice that I'm not really paying attention to the order uh, C, G, T, A, G here. That's just kind of random at the moment. Uh, we'll talk about when the order is important. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, and uh, I'll put a few more, and then I'm going to jump ahead again. So I went ahead and finished building my strand of nucleotides, and we can see that uh, this is only one half of our uh, DNA ladder, but we have this repeating phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar uh, as kind of the uprights of our ladder. Now this is a single strand of nucleotides, and we know that DNA is made of a double strand, so we need to bring in some more uh, nucleotides. So let me bring in uh, some more of these. And remember from our earlier videos that uh, we learned Chargaff's rule of complementary base pairing, that opposite every C in this DNA ladder, opposite every cytosine, will be a guanine. They're complementary base pairs. And opposite every guanine then has to be a cytosine. And opposite this thymine, must be an adenine. Those are the complementary base pairs that Chargaff taught us. And as we continue to line up the complements across from each other, A's with T's and C's with G's, we can see that we can go ahead and build the bond from the sugar of one to the phosphate of the next, just like we did on the first strand. So I'll continue with this. Actually, I'm going to pause the video and, and uh, add the rest of them in and then come back. I'm going to 
and keep moving these in and building uh, this other strand and uh, hopefully you can see that while we didn't care about the order going down you know, C, A, uh, or G, A, C right here but the across is very important we have to be very particular about what we put across because we have these complementary pairs and now we're starting to see our ladder a little more clearly we can see that as we're going down we have our uprights of our ladder being alternating phosphate sugar phosphate sugar phosphate sugar and so we have our uprights of our ladder and we can start to see the rungs of our ladder we'll talk about that in just a minute so we can say that the sides of the uprights are made of alternating phosphate groups of one nucleotide with the sugar of the next and the rungs of the ladder are made of pairs of complementary bases A's with T's and C's with G's now at this point we have two distinct uh, strands we have this strand uh, there and we have this strand over here and we have to find a way to connect them together so uh, we need to look at what's holding these bases together this C with this G and this A with this T it turns out that these base pairs are held together by hydrogen bonds we learned about hydrogen bonds when we talked about our properties of water we talked about them being weak attractions between water molecules but here we have those hydrogen bonds within a molecule these weak attractions holding the base pairs together are hydrogen bonds. And what's interesting because we know that hydrogen bonds are not strong bonds so the molecule that holds the two sides of the DNA ladder together uh, the two strands uh, is actually a series of very weak bonds and we'll see later why that's kind of an important thing. Now there's one more thing we need to notice here while these two strands here are complementary they're kind of running parallel they're actually running anti-parallel. Now what does that mean? here I have a phosphate as our first part of this side and here it's a sugar and if we move down to the bottom we'll see the opposite that this strand ends in a sugar and this strand ends in a phosphate group the nucleotides are kind of flipped over from one each other from each other now we can look at each of these strands having the phosphate or the sugar open and designate one end as a five prime end and one is a three prime end the five prime end is the side with the phosphate and the three prime end is the sugar and these five prime and three prime refer to the the numbered carbon and the sugar that this phosphate is attached to this is the five uh, prime sh carbon right here in this corner there and this would be the three prime carbon here but the way I remember it is phosphate and five both make the F sound and we should see that it's um, again anti-parallel so that opposite every five prime is a three prime and opposite every three prime end is a five prime end Let's see if we can grab another one of these and bring it down. So opposite of five prime is a three prime, and opposite three prime is a five prime, and so they got to be uh, opposite from each other. So there we have our DNA ladder. But this is not the real shape of DNA. Instead, the molecule is twisted on itself in a form we call a double helix. In eukaryotic cells, we have multiple strands of DNA molecules organized with proteins into structures called chromosomes. So let's take a closer look at that structure. The DNA, here's our double helix like thread, is wrapped around spools of protein. These protein spools are called histones. And in this bottom drawing, we can get a better understanding of kind of how this is all organized. Here's our, our very, on a very small scale, two nanometers across our DNA molecule. And we can see that's, that's coiled up and wrapped around these spools of proteins, histones, which are then wrapped around each other and it's tightly wound until we get to our chromosomes. We can imagine the massive amount of genetic code of DNA that's uh, composed in one of these chromosomes. Now, we know that DNA is storing an organism's genetic information. It's controlling the production of proteins and thus kind of controls the biochemistry of an organism because proteins are the primary uh, components of uh, enzymes. Uh, and we know that the DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell in these strands called chromosomes or in these molecules called chromosomes. Um, and we talk, just talked about the structure of that DNA. And you have this, uh, this page of notes in your note packet, but I'm not going to teach this now. But just to kind of give us a heads up in terms of what we're going to be doing, this DNA is coding for the production of proteins. And each three-letter sequence, and by three-letter sequence we mean uh, as we're going down, so C, G, T, uh, right here would be a three letter sequence. This is enough information to code for production of one amino acid. So uh, to build a protein, uh, 
approximately 200 amino acids long, uh, we would need a code of approximately 600 lines of code or 600 rungs of ladder. Um, and so that's what we're going to be getting into as we move into protein synthesis. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to have to talk about uh, how DNA replicates, and that's the topic of our next video. So come back for that one.